Welcome to another special session of Virtual Symposium 2020. Really excited about our special guest today because I recruited um, this young lady out of the program, but I'll, I'll get to Alice in a second. Before we do that though, let's, let's take a moment, if you would, and give some thanks. The MSA class of 2020, uh, obviously, was looking forward to symposium. As you all know, this is a student produced event. They're gonna have some live programming, but I, I was asked to do some tape sessions, so uh, I'm doing it. But I, I really want to thank them, and if anybody out there has uh, connections with jobs that you know are coming up, please feel free to reach out to me, and we're gonna get each and every one of these kids placed before you know it. Also wanna thank our friends at AECOM for their continued uh, sponsorship of everything that we do and in particular our uh, the naming partner for our Center for Sports Administration. Our special guest today is Alice Petzold, someone that I have known uh, since taking my job with the Cavaliers because the smartest decision I ever made was was hiring her in 1991 but Alice uh, welcome aboard. Thank you Jim it's good to be here. I'm sorry that I can't be in Athens with everyone but I know we will have another shot at that. We will, but we're making history today. So Alice, before we start talking about your role as a uh, professional um, career coach, let, let's take our audience through your background really quickly. I recruit you to the Cavs in 1991, greatest sales job of my life because the job wasn't that sexy. It was an administrative <laughs> assistant, but you got to work with eight different departments. You, you then get promoted. So let's just talk about your time with the Cavs and what you think you were able to take from that job that then led you down to Atlanta. So walk them through your, your experiences there. Wow. Um, I think the, the thing that was so impactful for me was to have access to understanding how the organization looked from the inside. Um, so, you know, having access to understanding how the eight divisions drove their business, you know, understanding the distinction between revenue generating departments and non-revenue generating departments and how the, how the organization flowed, um, was, was very, it was invaluable for me. And it was also impactful for me to see how the relate how important the relationships were with the different department heads in your role and how you not only had to um sell things into the senior leadership but you also had to um engender support and collaboration from the directors that you oversaw which right. wasn't actually you know i think well, we don't necessarily we, we, think we were, of that being a thing. <laughs> we, we were the new kids on the block. So some of those folks we inherited and then over time, we were able to recruit some new folks. But in, in that role, you were helping me with marketing, ticket sales, sponsorship sales, premium suite sales, um, broadcasting, community relations. But I think I told you early on, I said, your career is going to grow with us, my prediction, on the uh, corporate sales and sponsorship side, which ended up being true. So your, your first move up in the organization, you went over to corporate sales. Yeah. You, um, I think, I think Jim, if I have the information right in my head, you promoted me about every 18 months in the seven years that I was there. So I got to have my hand in so many different things and it was at a unique time where we were, also moving from Richfield into downtown Cleveland, and there was all of the exposure to the consultants that we worked with on the building, as well as the creating creation of the new property. Um, you know, it was. Yeah, and then I, I always told you that, listen, um, when it's time and you can't grow or you feel like maybe you've hit the glass ceiling with the calves, you see something that's out there, I'll help you get it. And I was so proud of you, you know, because you used to, well, you did tell me that working in and around the Olympics was, was part of a, a lifelong goal, right? And, and then here you, you leave the Cavs, 
to go down to Atlanta. I forget the name of the agency, but you uh, were Meridian. Yeah, it was Meridian. Meridian. It was Welton and yeah, you're Charlie working Charlie. with all of the IOC's Olympic sponsors in was it Tokyo? Jap well, it was Nagano, Japan. Nagano, yeah. yeah. And I said, you know, I was so excited for you. I said, Listen, can you like send my kids and uh, a postcard <laughs> from the Olympics because they my kids grew up with you and and I thought isn't that cool she's gonna go work the Olympics like you can do anything in life look at Alice you know so talk to talk to us a little bit about about that experience oh uh, you know um, that experience was so everything I, I felt like you know everything first of all Jim we did at the Cavs was amazing you know keeping in mind we also had the NBA all-star game we had the NBA at 50 and hosted that illustrious crew of of players in right. in, in nba history um, the olympics was very special as well um, got to work with some very brilliant folks there at meridian um, but for me the thing that was so impactful was learning the the barriers of culture and how to be sensitive to cultural differences and um, all of the things to take into consideration when you are bringing this type of an event to another country and you're inviting all the other countries. I mean, we're talking about 198 um, organizations that are part of this from all over the world. And so how do you host an event where people from all of these different places are coming and there's so many different languages and there's so many different um, comforts that people need in being there but um i don't know if i ever told you that i actually ran into this is a tangent but i ran into george gunn at the ice skating venue oh, and he wow. gave me a ride back uh to to my hotel it was so funny because you know the gunn family was such an amazing group and we got to meet them through the course mm -hmm. of the the Cavs experience but that was one of my Where's Waldo moments where like, you know, all of a sudden bumping into George Gunn and what a small George, world it was. Yeah. George was like that. He would fly around the world on his jet and going to film festivals and just the complete opposite of. of <laughs> okay, re real quick, before we shift gears and start talking about your your role as a career coach, uh, you also had some sponsorship uh, experience with NASCAR and yeah. uh, sponsor direct. So really a lot of your career did end up on the corporate partnership side of the business. What, what did you take away from some of that that you think has uh, led you to where you are today in being a very successful coach? Well, um, <clears throat> I, I think I became a very solutions oriented person. Um, and I also, I love people. And the bigger the personality, the better for me. Like I don't, I don't shy away from um, bold or direct people. So, you know, I, I really, I enjoyed every opportunity that I had around, you know, creating solutions. Because I think that's what marketing partnership is all about. You know, it's like you're looking at what, there are two parties involved. Two people want things. Sometimes they don't, you know, these two parties want things. Sometimes they don't always want to give what the other person wants to have. And so it's always creating some sort of solution and some sort of outgrowth out of, you know, a complex, you know, scenario. So I always enjoyed it. Well, you, you had prior to going into coaching full time, you had been an amazing mentor to a lot of our students and a lot of people, but when was that aha moment of like, you know what? I, I think I'm gonna take a look at this, uh, this, this field of professional coaching. When, when did that kind of, you know, what led you to where you are today? Um, hmm. Cause you've been at it now for a while and, and you're, I'm gonna brag about you cause I can, <laughs> but you're, you're really good at it, but what, did you, did you get there by design or did you happen to fall into it? So how did you pivot into coaching? I, 
I, I, I just really enjoyed the work that I did with the folks that I mentored through the Ohio University process. Right. Um, and I saw it as really like the thing that brought me the most joy was helping people to um, find their path. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jose Duverge is someone who, you know, I ended up working with quite a bit. And so, uh, well, you and I used to laugh about Jose, but you know, are you being the real Jose, the Brooklyn Jose or? <laughs> yeah. Like I, I remember when I first met him and it, he, I'm not sure he'd appreciate me sharing this story, but he has a pretty good sense of humor, but you know, he really wanted to, to work with me as his mentor. And I was like, look, I work with women and I, you know, like my intention is to, is to support women in, in charting their path. And I don't know what, you know, I can provide you as somebody who is, you know, like I'm from Ohio and yeah. I'm like the whitest white girl out there. Um, and, and I remember him saying, no, like, I think that there's something that you have for me that you, you know, you, you you've gone down roads that I want to go down. And I'm like, okay. So we, we took it on, but I said to him, I was like, you know, when somebody's going through an evolution and trying to talk the talk that people are advising them to talk. Right. Right. It's just not them. Yeah. And that was the thing that I, that I saw for him. I was just like, you know, there's a version of you that's so amazing and it can also be corporate and it can be impactful and you don't have to lose the flavor of, the guy who grew up in Brooklyn. And I think, you know, he's an amazing human and doing great work and you yeah, know, excited yeah. to, that he's going to be a father soon and um, has an amazing bride. But it's so cool to be able to have that level of conversation with people right? and also allow them to have access to themselves. Cool. All right. Well, we're going to get rolling through a series of questions um, that are going to really focus on coaching. I don't know. We'll, we'll get off on some tangents as, as I always do on these things, but thank you for joining us today and we'll get started with the, uh, the next slide. Sounds great. But what, what I want to do is just start this session with a better understanding of what, what is coaching. And most people think of coaching when they're, they're watching a ball game or something, but talk, talk to uh, everybody on what is coaching from a professional coaching perspective. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about coaching and uh, I'll, so I'll be bringing in the International Coach Federation and their definition just to get us kicked off. So the way the International Coach Federation defines coaching is partnering with clients in a thought-provoking and creative process. Okay, so it's partnering with clients in a thought-provoking and creative process that inspires them to maximize their professional and personal potential. I like it. I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's right up your alley, isn't it, yeah. Jim? Um, I think the, 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 the thing to keep in mind when you're working with coaching is that it's very, um, it's very curiosity based. So we're taking out things that you might necessarily, you might, you might think have more to do with coaching than they actually do. So we're looking at creating high value conversations um, that spark curiosity and creativity um, so that we can identify previously hidden issues and uncover new options um, and fresh insights. So it's not a lot of advice giving. Um, we see in, in, in a lot of mentoring where people want advice from people that have gone down the road before. And some of that my advice may very well be valuable. Um, but in coaching, what we're really looking to do is to support the individual in tapping into their wisdom. Okay. And, and, and then practicing that as they move forward. So like, for example, Jim, you're someone who has been such a tremendous mentor and um, almost like a shepherd of people in their careers in sports. But the people that you've, you've been that mentor and shepherd for, 
they develop their own unique leadership qualities and styles. They're not, you know, Jim Kaler's, right. Jim Kaler's out there in the world. So it's supporting people and recognizing that, um, you know, they really do have inner wisdom and they can evolve as their own leaders in their own way. So bottom line, coaching is a lot more asking and listening and not so much telling and selling people. Gotcha. Gotcha. It'd take me a while to get, get used to that, but I'm sure I can do it. But let, let me, <laughs> in, in the uh, career development class I'm doing, or just finished up with our current students, we pulled an article from Harvard that basically said that 90% of your career development is on you. And, and I still think a lot of people today think that it's on their boss. And what the article went on to point out is like, your boss doesn't have enough time to really focus more uh, of that time into career development. So you've got to be careful when you're picking your organizations and you have to look for room for growth and, and all of that. So um, do, you, do you oftentimes hear people lament that uh, they weren't getting that coaching from uh, their direct supervisors? Uh, I think that, there is a there's there is actually an expectation that someone you know like someone who brings you into an organization is going to support your growth and development um but i think that's a that's a mindset that that we as coaches are are, are working a lot with our clients on um breaking up uh because ultimately you know you're in control of your destiny. You chart your path. We want to encourage you to, you know, create the opportunities. Um, but I do think that that is a, a prevailing mindset of an expectation that someone's going to take care of someone. Yeah, and I'll send you a copy of that article. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about the training that you put. I mean, one of our alums might want to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to reach out to Alice. I want to be a coach, but what? Talk to us about how, what, what's the training all about? Um, okay, so in order to talk about the training, um, I'd love to lay a little bit of foundation about like the, where we are in coaching as an industry. Okay, go ahead. So coaching as an industry is about 30 years old. Um, and the International Coach Federation has been in existence for 25 of those 30 years. Um, the, the thing to keep in mind is that there's, it's not a regulated industry, although it's governed by the ICF and the ICF provides credentials for coaches. And there's a very specific, uh, way that coaches are trained and evaluated in ICF accredited programs. There's really no barrier to entry. So with coaching becoming such a hot trend and people confusing it so much with consulting um, or other support professions, you find a lot of people that are just hanging a shingle out there. So there's no barrier to entry. And there's a, a broad array of coach training programs. Um, you know, they might be anywhere, cost anywhere from $1,000 to $20,000. Some of them are, you know, in, have been in existence for a very long time and continue to grow and evolve. And some are just getting into the market because it's hot. Um, so to make a long story longer, you can get trained on a weekend virtual coach training program, or you can do a year long coach training program. That's, you know, involves a lot more participation. Okay. But without turning this into an infomercial, talk to us about the way your company does it because that'll that'll give everybody a, a, a feeling and you and i have spoken enough that i i'm pretty excited the way you guys do it but but share with our audience you know how if if, if someone were to go with your specific organization how are coaches trained uh okay so um one of the things i love about this and this may be a broad uh a big leap for me to say this is that it reminds me a great deal of the way we um, 
we, we work with our students at the Center for Sports Administration. So there's two components to our, well, there's three components to our coach training program. Uh, but I always like to let people know up front that we are not the fastest way to train to be a coach and we're not the cheapest. <laughs> so um, our coach training programs are typically one year long. Um, they involve 12 in-person weekends where people train for two days. Um, there's a lot of practical experience that's gained over those 12 months. Um, we train in small cohorts. So our cohorts are at the largest 24 um, and they've been at the smallest five. So you're with that intact group for the entire term of the training. Um, well, I, 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 I would applaud that because, you know, over the years we have found that what's made OU OU is the connections that are built through the cohort and uh, I, I got to believe in a training session. If, if I'm seeing you uh, once a month for 12 months, I'm, the, the barriers quickly get broken down so I can, I can speak uh, the truth in, a, in, a, in an open session. Is that, is that one of the values coming out of the cohort? Yeah, you know, I didn't realize it so much when I was at OU, but like, you know, one of the things that was so great about the program was that you were with your class and you had to learn how to work with everyone. You know, and they're different people, although I think OU attracts a very like-minded quality of human, I also think that there are very different styles that you learn how to connect with and how to put on programs with, you know, um, it's a very practical application. So similarly in our coach training program, the, you know, the team works together on a variety of projects where they are, you know, they have opportunities to work with one another, to learn from one another. Um, people have a variety of different backgrounds. So our coaches come from fields ranging from, you know, finance to massage therapy. And so, you know, people also, there are some people that are at the, looking for their next chapter in their career, maybe going into retirement or creating an, an additional career for themselves. And some people come straight out of undergrad, um, you know, younger kids knowing that they want to pursue a career in coaching. So it's a broad spectrum of humans, all from different backgrounds, and you're learning so much in working with one another um, throughout the course of the year. Okay, cool. Um, so when I leave and graduate from your program, let's just kind of look at the 12 month model, do I get certain materials that'll make me a little bit more comfortable as I set out on my journey to become a professional coach? And is there a playbook or two that I'm, I'm leaving with? What's, what's, <laughs> yeah. what's, what's, um, yeah. So um, perhaps one distinction to draw is that with the current coach training programs that are out there, there's a group that is um, credentialed through the ICF. So we're certified through the International Coach Federation. So you have, I think uh, when you showed my my title, it said uh, PCC, Professional Certified Coach. Right. So that means that I have met certain requirements with the International Coach Federation. Mm -hmm. um, it means I coach at a certain level and I have a certain amount of experience. Now, you are a PCC. Yeah. Okay. So, so coming out of our program, you have a preferred path to certification because we have the ICF, if you will, stamp of approval. So you have a pathway to certification, which is really what distinguishes coaches from one another right now in the marketplace. Like you, you can't be just somebody throwing a shingle out there with a, you know, you can't access a certification unless you have a credentialed education um, as well as, you've demonstrated that you have the skills. So that's something that you walk away from with our program is the opportunity to access that. Gotcha. And is there any kind of support once you leave? I mean, do you, do you get uh, additional coaching on how to build your book of business and, and yeah. put everything into practice? Um, so you, you, are, you are trained during the course of the program on how to grow and work with clients. Um, 
And we have a huge community. We've been co uh, training coaches for 20 years now. So we have, um, I think the similar, similarly, we have a very big alumni group and we have a large affiliate program. So it provides continuing education and it keeps people in, in the coaching community and, and growing because the trends are growing. So, new developments grow so fast and you know how this is like, yeah, and we, so I've great. got a, I've got a question coming up on trends, but it's, okay. I, I think COVID-19 and we're going to talk a little bit about that too, might, might uh, really amplify this whole industry. Okay. Uh, Alice, you talked about the international federation, but just, Take us a little deeper on on how it's that this whole industry is regulated and what people should be looking for if they're thinking of going out and getting trained. Um, well, it's actually not regulated. There is there's no barrier to entry. Anyone can call themselves a coach, um, but there is a certification process and a credentialing process. So. If you're out in the marketplace looking for a coach, my recommendation is that you look for someone who's certified. What that means is they have a credential of, there are three levels of credentialing. Associate is the entry level of credential, which indicates that that person has coached for at least 100 hours and they have met a minimum of a they coach at a level of a five on a scale of one to 10. Okay. This is that, that first level. And then the second level is that the individual has coached for over 500 hours and has, is coaching at a level of seven on a scale of one to 10. Okay. And then beyond that, that is master certified, which is coaching over a thousand hours. Um, and, coaching at a, at a higher level, eight to nine on a scale of one to 10. So these things have become more and more important as coaching has become more and more popular as a managerial style and as something that um, is a great accelerator for leadership and results. But um, I think you can't go wrong if you go with a, you know, investigate a credential coach. Um, and I always recommend to people to have conversations with three coaches um, that have the same level of certification. Um, this, is, this is so valuable because you really want somebody who you can connect with and have a conversation with. And, and um, oftentimes there's no way of really knowing that without going out in the field and having a couple of different conversations. Uh, Allison, in putting this, session together today we talked about different questions that i could throw your way but one that i want to get a better handle on is the distinction with coaching as opposed to other support professions and when i think of other professions i think of consulting and i would also think in in terms of support um therapy sometimes so where where does coaching fit in and what makes it different Okay, I'll give this example. Um, so let's say you're in a hole. Okay. Like you're a human being, you're in a hole, six feet deep, okay? Hopefully, the, hopefully I'm standing up and not laying down, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you're standing up, but you're, you're in a hole. And so I look at it this way. The consultant would come by and say to you, you're in a hole. My professional opinion tells me these are the three best ways to get out of the hole and the procedures to follow to get out of the hole. Okay. Okay. Um, the therapist would come by and say, how did you get here? What's the experience that you're having? you know, what led you here? What are the, what's the, you know, going in to find the deeper meaning. Right. And, the, and, and that, and the coach would come along and say, you're in a hole, six feet in the ground. Now what? 
Okay. So when I think of that, it gives me a, a better feel for what coaching is all about, but it also, and I've done a little bit of it, it it's kind of like being a moderator in a focus group, <laughs> right? Your, 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 your job is not to lead them or to put words into their mouths, but to get them talking about themselves, correct? Yeah, and um, I think that there's, a, there's another way to look at this. And in, in say, for example, you look at, um, I know, you know, personal trainers and financial analysts are very popular for people. Um, as, a, as a coach, I'm going to have conversations with people about, you know, their fitness and their wellness. I'm going to have conversations with people about their money and their relationship to money. Now, I'm not a financial analyst or a financial planner, so I'm not going to support them in planning right. with their money, but I am going to have a conversation with them about their relationship to money, Okay. how they're spending their money, how they're, what, they, what they're doing with the money, what they're not doing with the money, where their mythology came from around their relationship with money and the impacts that it has on them. Um, so you know, I'm not an expert in that area, but I'm going to allow them the space to explore that. Um, you know, if you look at the gym model, um, most gyms are designed to have people not go. They want you to pay the fees and the personal trainer still gets paid whether or not you show up. Right, right. If so, every, after the first of the year, if everybody that stuck to their New Year's pledge, I mean, there wouldn't be enough room <laughs> in the gym, right? Yeah. There wouldn't be enough room, but you know, like, so I would be working with people around, you know, what are the blocks in the way of them taking better care of themselves? You know, I'm not going to provide them with a nutritional plan or a workout schedule, but I am going to work with them around like, Hey, why do you say you want this? And then you stop doing the things that you know will make a difference. Right. Right. Gotcha. So we can get into some establishing some, some patterns of behavior and, supporting people in course correcting when they typically bail on things that they say that they want. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's move on to the next question if you're ready. Okay. Alice, why hire a coach? It's a great question um, that I get all the time. And, you know, typically I flip it back to the person that I'm talking to. Um, looking at what types of challenges they're facing as leaders, as individuals. Um, you know, the, the opportunity that's there in hiring a coach is that it's someone outside of the water that you're swimming in. Oh, so, hey, as, as two former swimmers, I love that. I love that analogy. Go run that again. Someone who's what outside the water you're swimming. It, in? It's someone outside the water that you're swimming in. Um, the on teams in organizations there's oftentimes things that are unspoken that are impeding the success of the individuals or the collective okay. and so what i find with my my clients who are in a leadership position on teams is that it's oftentimes challenging to have people really speak the truth to you when you are their supervisor. Mm -hmm. So Jim, this is one thing that was actually very fun for me and working for you at the Cavs is that we, you know, you, you came to me quite a bit to be like, okay, this is what they're telling me, but what's actually going on out there. Exactly. <laughs> and so sometimes as a, you know, as a coach, you are that one voice that's actually probing and asking the questions that people aren't talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, we oftentimes as coaches look at how there is an intention that an organization has and then there's a default. Right. Gotcha. What's actually happening. So there's what people are saying is impo most important for the organization. And then there's what's being communicated to the team. You know, um, if, you, if you look, researchers have found that when people – 
are in doubt about what behavior is appropriate inside of an organization, they will copy the actions of others and particularly those who have power and status. So it might be that you know, what the organization is saying is one thing, but how the senior executives are operating is different. And so people will default to emulating the behavior as opposed to following the directive. Gotcha. Gotcha. Which can get very confusing. For well, yeah. I, I, you know, and, and I, I look back and remember my days with the calves and I, you know me, I, I love to brainstorm and kick around ideas, but I, I, came to a point where I, if I really want my staff to brainstorm, I can't be in there because I'm, I'm going to go in there and sell them on my idea. And I, I really want to see what they have to say. Okay. Uh, let's keep her going, but you're coaching under a different era in history. It's been a hundred years since we've had a pandemic. What's it like coaching during COVID-19? Hmm. I find that I have the same job now and it's all the more important. Um, I think that people are in a brand new relationship with uncertainty. Okay. we you know we, we we get going as 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 individuals or teams and we think we know what's going to happen in fact we are oftentimes paid for our capacity to predict and plan and move forward on those plans now we don't actually know that that's how it's going to go right like but we're paid for that predictability now there are so many variables that it's you know it's looking at how can people get outside of the restrictions and the limitations of what they have and get creative and innovate so my job is to you know support people in asking the kind of questions that are going to evoke the excellence in their team and the innovation and gender in, in gender collaboration um but not to be restricted by what the current circumstances are. Right. So I'm never involved in a conversation about the circumstances, but I'm constantly pulling people out of them so that they can have a conversation about what's next in the future. Now, we like certainty. As human beings, we love it. I mm -hmm. might actually say we are, um, you know, we're addicted to certainty. Like we want to know how it's going to go, mm -hmm. but we don't actually know. And so the whole space of getting outside of what we know and getting creative and getting innovative requires pulling ourselves out of all the things we think we know. Is that too esoteric? <laughs> no, because I, I was talking to uh, Caroline Savini yesterday and I think that COVID-19 is a serious pandemic and I look back at our careers and I, I remember going through an NBA lockout and we, we were struggling with, okay, we're either going to start the season in January, which eventually happened, or we're not going to have a season. And that was the closest that I had ever been to severe uncertainty in my career. And uh, as a result, I, I told people, you know what it did? It gave us time to think. It gave us time to go back and re-examine like, hey, when we bring basketball back, what are we going to do for our fans to win them over? Now, nobody was dying, but uh, in this industry, like any industry, you, you get on that treadmill and I tell our students all the time, you're going 120 miles an hour. You don't have time to sit back and, and really think and get strategic. So I think a lot of innovation is going to come out of uh, COVID-19 and I, I think that uh, people are, they're certainly going to be more comfortable letting their employees work from home more often because the, the world's changing. You know, if you asked me to do a Zoom interview with you six weeks ago, I would have been totally intimidated. But, uh, you know, I had to like, okay, let's figure out how to do this. And we can't let our uh, alumni down. We got to put something together for this virtual symposium. So it's, it's a unique time. 
All right, um, let's, enough of me, this is about you. Trends in coaching, okay? It's, it, as you said, the industry is not that old. So my graphic designer at Google Images um, came up with a slide for me and, and I don't know, somebody must have been writing an article, but you, you've been at it long enough. So what, what trends are you seeing in, the, in this area? Um, so what we see more and more of is that coaching used to be very much for the elite. So for high potentials inside of organizations or for the C-suite executives. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're starting to see now more is more people embarking on a coaching relationship earlier in their career to have that outside resource. Um, it's, it's something that I think is a, a, an outstanding trend in this willingness for support. So like an openness about creating additional resources. Um, the, uh, do you, Alice, do you think that's a generational thing that the younger generation is going to be more open-minded to coaching than maybe the baby boomers? Uh, per, perhaps, um, we see a lot of, um, you know, there's so many changes that we've had culturally. So when you look at the, the, the life, like the, the career span of people now, mm -hmm. it's more likely that they will have more jobs, whereas, you know, individuals might have gone into an organization 50 years ago and had a career lifetime with one company. Um, right. And so outside resources, I think, and in, in that, that access to having a coach or, uh, you know, even mentoring grew, was a big thing that grew, I think, when we were, like, say, when we were with the Cavs in the 90s and into the 2000s, mentoring became a big thing. But I think that there's more availability of the resource, there's more quality product out there, and there's more um, open conversation about uh, availing yourself of resources. You know, I think you see leaders like um, Brene Brown, who is very much on the forefront right now with, with the younger generations as well. Um, Carol Dweck and her work with mindset and looking at how to adopt a growth mindset over a fixed mindset and what's available there. I think, you know, also the, the, the thing to keep in mind is that we used to have very compartmentalized lives mm -hmm. and now everything is, is visible and everything is knowable. So in order for people to keep up in this culture, um, there's really not much know it all. There's not much future in know it all culture. Right. There's far more future in the learn it alls. So people who are open to growing and expanding and developing people, as opposed to telling people what to do. Yeah, and I I, I think maybe because I just follow uh, sports business in the media, but the amount of collaboration that's going on now between leagues and competitors because listen, our whole industry has been shut down and we're, we're in this together. So let's, let's get after it. Okay. Um, what am I looking for in a coach? So if I make the decision that I'm going to go and I, I've, I've wanted to hold off on this to talk about uh, cost, but before we talk about cost, what should I be looking for in a coach? Let's say hypothetically, um, I'm working for a, uh, an organization that just goes under the XFL. Okay. And, and now I'm thinking, okay, what do I do? Vince might've given me some severance and you know what, I'm going to go find a coach. What, what should I be looking for? Well, I always encourage people to look for coaches who are certified so that they have a credential. So you'd want a credential coach, right? Um, I also think you want someone who you're comfortable with. So I encourage people to have three coaching sessions. Um, 
I also encourage people to put it out to their networks. Um, I'm someone who I don't have a very large social media presence or do a lot of advertising. Right. But most of my business comes to me through referral. So I've been coaching now for, I'm in my 10th year, um, nine years after graduating. Um, so I really rely on people referring me. So I say, ask friends, ask people who you admire if they've ever worked with a coach um, okay, and so see let, who they know. Let's go back to your earlier advice on before you make a decision on a coach, you should talk to three. So if somebody said, hey, Alice, um, I want to just talk to you. Does that mean you're going to give them 15, 20 minutes of your time or in that conversation, what, what kind of questions should I be asking? And I, I, I get the certified part, but what, what else, if one of our alums comes to you and, and you're totally booked, you're not available, but, but Jim, I think you ought to have three conversations and ask these three questions. What, what are the questions? Well, putting you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually think that the best way to identify the coach for you is to have a sample coaching conversation. So I would encourage you to look for yourself at, you know, what, what are some areas that you want to address in the coaching partnership? What are some things that you want to move forward? <clears throat> I talk a lot about like a preferred future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our clients, there's nothing wrong for them. Like their lives are good. They, their, their, their desire is typically to grow into a new space. And so look at what are three things in your life you might like to move forward and bring that conversation to your coach, the, the potential coach and, and, and get a taste of what that coaching relationship would be like. What kind of questions does the coach ask? What type of new insights open up for you inside the conversation? Um, so it's, the, it's, the most, it's, yeah, it's, the most important it's, thing is, is someone you're comfortable with and they support you in new ways of thinking. So it's realistic that uh, someone would give you 15 minutes as an icebreaker so you get a feel for their personality and what they're all about? Yeah, I, I, I recommend a one hour session as a complimentary session. Most, most coaches will do this and it's self-serving. I want to know a little bit about you before I take you on as a client. You know, I want to know that you have given some thought to this and there's some stuff that you really want to move forward. Um, for example, I am, I'm working with a, um, a firm right now and we have identified, mm, I think 50 women inside the organization. And all 50 of these women are having three complimentary coaching sessions with coaches from our organization okay. um, to see who they will hire. Okay. Um, cool. But, you know, the best way to understand it is to actually have an experience of it and what it would be like to work with that coach. And like I said, as a coach, it's self-serving because I want to know that you're in this for something that I can support you in. Right. I, I was inspired, though, to hear that a company would invest in their employees to that level because that's, that's making a statement. So I, I don't, I, are you seeing more and more organizations going into the, that type of uh, uh, added value for their employees? Yes, we are. You know, we, um, we're seeing more organizations invest in the employees. We're also seeing, uh, I don't know if I shared with you, our team in New York does a great deal of work with Chief, which is a, a tremendous initiative for women's leadership to support their growth and their ascension to C-suite positions. And so a number of our coaches are Chief facilitators in that uh, New York metro area as part of that initiative. Um, it's it's really such an accelerant to leadership and to um, growing organizations and employee retention um, that it's for many organizations has become a very worthy investment. Gotcha. I, I'll probably follow up with you offline because some of our faculty are doing some research on um, 
young professional women and their uh, ambition or lack of to get to the uh, to the C-suite. Okay, um, closing questions. But here's what I like to do on 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 this session is uh, I'm going to pepper you with some quick, you know, I I. I Stole this from Abe Madcar at the SBJ, but Abe does a great job at hosting some panels. So I'm going to throw some quick questions at you, take you down memory lane at Ohio University, and just we'll, we'll blitz through five or six questions, okay? Okay. Okay. So you come back to Athens to visit, and based on your experience there, I say, Alice, I'll take you anywhere for lunch. Where do you want to go? The pub. <laughs> Cheeseburger at the pub, okay. Um, fondest memory of Ohio University as an undergrad, because you, you got your undergrad degree there. Oh, this was crazy. My girlfriends and I, uh, I was in, I was a Chi Omega at okay. Ohio University, and we were walking around campus um, taking photos of mm -hmm. different places that, you know, were significant to us. And we stumbled, we were walking by President Ping's house. President Ping was the president of the university at the time. And he just happened to be outside and he took a photo with us. Oh, cool, cool. And I think the other thing that I can actually show you a picture of, I'll send you a picture of, um, I was part of the Peden Stadium fundraising project. Oh, with the and, tower, right? Oh my gosh, and so I got to meet Dow Finsterwald and Arnold Palmer. Oh, how cool is that? And they told the most hysterical story about the first time they met Jack Nicholas. Oh, yeah. And, and Dow, I mean, um, no, you'd be proud to know that uh, we now have a Dow Finsterwald golf tournament that benefits undergrads. Oh, and, wow. And our mutual friend, I think you know Kenny, Kenny Kerr. Yes. Donated the first 5,000. I said, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll get the undergrad students. This will be like, their version of race for a reason, and they they put on a tournament. So Dow is now eighty eight years young, maybe eighty nine by now. And uh, what a great guy! And and until Joey Burrow came around, I, I would tell people he's the greatest athlete ever to come out of uh, Athens County. So all right, back back to the quick questions. Uh, Ten years from now, the sport that will make the greatest amount of growth in our country. Little little sports question for you. So 20, 20, 30, your prediction on, hey, if I was coming out of grad school, that's a sport I'm going to keep my eye on. It's really, it's taken off. Um, I'll tell you what Caroline said after you go, but. Okay. I, you know. While you're thinking about it, I'll, I'll just share this. In 1950, the two most popular sports in the United States were horse racing and boxing, because the NFL hadn't really hit the TV age till the 60s. And think about horse racing and boxing. You can gamble on both, you know? So it was, it was a popular, the two most popular sports uh, in the country. 2030, what, what, what sport is going to benefit the most over the next 10 years? Maybe that's a better way to ask the question. Well, um, you know, I, I think soccer has been like the, the thing that everybody is always thinking about and, and that, 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 that will grow. But, you know, I'm more curious about what, what moves uh, like CrossFit is going to do because there, this is something that, that I see as a trend that has caught on like wildfire with people who I would not have imagined would be into that, that, that type of activity and that structure, but right. it's, they're doing something on a community level that I think is very groundbreaking. You know, if you look at the, the business of the business of the gym model where it's actually designed so that you don't, you buy a, expensive membership and you know five percent of the members actually use it right? right whereas um crossfit has become this new community galvanizer at a level that i think 
is quite extraordinary. And they're also in the, in the creation of their games and the competitions that they have, they're engendering a participation um, on, on quite a global scale. Well, you'd be happy to know that Dr. Uh, Lawrence, Heather Lawrence, is all about CrossFit and has built a relationship with the CrossFit Games where our students actually go there and do on-site surveys and uh, wonderful organization. And I, I agree, plenty of room for growth over the next 10 years. Okay, uh, <clears throat> quick hitters, okay. Uh, three classmates that you remember the most. So I don't want to get you in trouble with the rest of your classmates from OU, and these have to be grad school classmates. Three that you remember the most just based on your time at Ohio University. So these need to be people who I was at there at school with at the same time? Yes, they had to be in your graduating class. Most, most, most memorable. Then I'm, I'm gonna send them an email and make sure they watch this, uh, this taping. <laughs> Well, you, you might crack up to know that I was on a Zoom call with Chris Crenwelge and Kelly Archibald. Oh, great, great. And I laughed so hard. It was such welcome laughter. <laughs> you know, I yeah. find that um, they're two of the funniest people I've ever known. So, you know, speaking of good, good guys, George Johnson. Oh, yeah. One of the... One of the one of the best guys out there, just an amazing human. It was so fun to get to work with him. Um, uh, he's somebody who I think I'm gonna reach out to this week as well as Alan Sharp. Alan Sharp uh, was president of our class and another great guy. It's so hard to just limit it to three. I so, and I could keep going because I have so much overlap with different program years, but those yeah. are just some of the highlights on my reel. Okay, favorite place in town for an adult beverage? And it's back when you were in school, not not today, but like what? Uh, back what when was, I was in school, what was your bar? <laughs> I would go with the CI. Okay. Any? No, 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 no. Let me change that. I think it's definitely the Crystal. I think it's the Crystal. Okay. And was that the official uh, bar for your class, or did you have allegiance there as an undergrad? I. I might be getting this wrong, but here's another hit from my program, T.D. Lovett. I think T.D. Lovett worked at the Crystal. And so that was our, that seemed to be more of our place than another. But T.D. is also on my high, highlight reel Good. of um, amazing folks. And Jan Lovett, of course, was part of the program. So sure. that was very fun to get to know her as well. Yeah. And hopefully T.D. was providing some complimentary beverages from time to time, right? I can neither confirm or deny that. <laughs> uh, fight night. What, what are your memories about fight night? Um, our, by know, the way, our, our students really wish that, that we still had fight night, but I said, hey, that decision was made by someone in Ohio's legal office that understood that liability better than I, and it, it, it happened before I, I came back to work full time at, at Ohio University. Just a quick disclaimer, but people love talking about fight night. Were you, were you involved much with fight night? Well, I think the thing that was so special about, that's so special about OU is that you get such real experience mm -hmm. and you have that real experience of, you know, working with your classmates on a project and they're not, they're not cakewalks, no live event is. And so you learn so much about one another and you learn to be a team player and you learn to um, you know, be creative. And, and so I think that's why it's such a treasured memory. It's just, it's so much fun to have the real experience. And I think that's something that is so important about any type of training that you're doing, that you're actually getting your hands involved in how things are made and done so that you, because, Putting on an event is not a philosophical. Yeah, and we, we are, as you know, we're, we're given great experience with uh, Race for a Reason, and they'll have, oh, I don't know, a thousand participants, and they're raising over $50,000 for different charities. So think about what's happened to our brand. We went from selling too much beer in Bird Arena <laughs> to uh, raising money through uh, a 5K, a sprint triathlon, and a mud race. So times are changing. 
Uh, okay, one, any question that you want to ask of me before we close this session out? Uh, I'm, I'm curious for you, Jim, how you, what you notice about your leadership and shifts in your leadership as you've evolved. Uh, I've mellowed over time, but the, the greatest example of mellowing um, I would see every day in my office, that's Doc Higgins. So some of our um, older alums like, that guy was tough, you know, so uh, I've mellowed and if you were my coach, I'm working hard on becoming an active listener. Oh my gosh, that's the keys to the kingdom right there. Yeah, so most people, especially sales types like myself, because I get labeled as a sales guy, even though I think I got some marketing skills. Uh, most people listen to respond. I think as I get older, and I guess they, they say only 35% of the population can do it. I'm trying to listen to understand instead of listening to respond. So that's, if, if you were my coach, I'd say, all right, coach, <laughs> uh, help me get there. What else could I be doing, right? <laughs> that's really great, Jim. You know, that's actually one of the ways that they, that, that we evaluate coaches is based on their capacity to listen. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it probably is my favorite skill that has carried over into my life um, in terms of my personal relationships is, is that capacity to listen actively. Right. And I, I, I would have to go to a 12 month training <laughs> session because I, I think my fear going into coaching would be, I'd want to be over on the left side of that road and just telling them how to do it, you know, and consulting. And like, it would, it would take some time to, uh, to make that, but I, I think I could do it. Hey, um, did we talk price? So just, just to close out, if somebody's interested in um, going out and hiring a career coach, what, what kind of money are they looking at from a, a low end to a high end. And, and I think you're saying, listen, if you're going to do it, you got to do at least so many sessions or you're, you're really, you know, you, you shouldn't be doing it. Right. Well, I think you'll, you'll see such a gamut of pricing out there. Um, I can tell you that for our, our graduates, um, we recommend that people begin at five fifty a month. Okay. And then you'll see, master certified coaches might go up to as much as like 1600 a month. Some, some might even be around 2000 a month. Um, that typically would include three to four sessions. Um, okay. It also would, um, you know, sometimes you see with people, there's, and also a great access point is group coaching. So if you're looking for, if, if somebody who's a younger student or somebody newer in their career and they're looking for some experience of coaching, there are some great group offerings that can be more affordable. So would, if, if somebody was serious about this, would your recommendation be, listen, give it a month, but then some people will want to continue or go on. Or if, if you're going to bring me on, are you going to say, Hey Jim, uh, with, with all due respect, you know, you, you got to sign on for three months, two months, six months, how, how, how does one determine how to budget for their, for an investment like this? Well, um, I would encourage someone to not engage with the coach for any, anything less than four months. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that that, you know, the thing about a coach is that a coach is going to tell you things that no one else will probably say to you. Uh, okay. so it, I always say the truth will set you free, but first it might piss you off. So mm -hmm. <laughs> you want to be in there for a commitment, of, I think four months in order to get through some of those places. Um, and I work with folks, you know, I think I've had some engagements at six months, but my preference is one year. Uh, I think my longest running client right now is I've been working with him for seven years oh, wow. um, on very different things. So, you know, um, very, very different initiatives, but he continues to grow and expand. And, you know, we're, we're coming up on our eighth year in the fall. Cool. 
All right, well, let's, um, let me thank you because one of the best decisions I ever made at the Cavaliers was to pick up the phone, call Ohio University, and talk to this guy by the name of Andy Kreutzer. And he said, well, I've got someone that would be ideal, but I don't think she's going to want to come up there to be your administrative assistant. But um, recruiting leads to uh, organizations being more successful and recruiting you into the cast where we promote, we didn't really get time, but we promoted you twice. And then next thing I know you're off to the Olympics with the, uh, the agency that was uh, working with all the IOC sponsors. So I'm, I'm just going to encourage our uh, alums and students to look up your entire background on uh, LinkedIn, but what, what an amazing career you had and you're continuing to, make an impact in the world as a uh, professional coach. So thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. So thanks for joining us today with uh, Alice Petzold as we took you behind the scenes to get a deeper understanding of career coaching. This is just one of a number of sessions that we're doing for a virtual symposium and stay well during COVID-19 and please feel free to reach out if uh, I can put you in direct contact with Alice or anything else that we can do. Thanks for joining us.